Disc 01, The Color of Magic By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 5x9 A desert inhabited by Discworld salamanders was a veritable lighthouse at house at night. Rinswind put them down and nodded grimly. With all the octarine light in this magical place the creatures had been gorging themselves, and then nature had taken its course. The altar. He looked up at Rinswind and grinned. Rinswind hoped that Rictus strung grimace was a grin. Mighty magic, commented the barbarian, pushing down heavily on the complaining blade with a hand the size of a ham. Now we share the treasure at. Rinswind grunted as something small and hard struck his ear. There was a gust of wind, hardly felt. How do you know there's treasure in there? He said. Hrun heaved, and managed to hook his fingers under the stone. You find choke apples under a choke apple tree, he said. You find treasure under altars. Logic. He gritted his teeth. The stone swung up and landed heavily on the floor. This time something struck Rinswine's hand heavily. He clawed at the air and looked at the thing he had caught. It was a piece of stone with five plus three sides. He looked up at the ceiling should it be sagging he tried raising a hand. It was immediately surrounded by a glowing octarine corona as the rising magical wind roared past. The gale raced through the room without stirring one iota of dust, yet it was blowing Rinswine's eyelids inside out. It screamed along the tunnels, its banshee wail bouncing madly from stone to stone. Two flower staggered up, bent double in the teeth of the astral gale. What the hell is this? He shouted. Rinswine half turned. Immediately the howling wind caught him, nearly pitching him over. Poltergeist eddies, spinning in the rushing air, snatched at his feet. Hrun's arm shot out and caught him. A moment later he and Tu Flower had been dragged into the lee of the ravaged altar, and lay panting on the floor. Beside them the talking sword Kring sparkled, its magical field boosted a hundredfold by the storm. Hold on! Screamed Rin Swind. The wind! Shouted Tu Flower. Where's it coming from? Where's it spirit of Belsham Haroth sank through the deeper thonic plains his brooding spirit was being sucked out of the very stones into the region which, according to the Discworld's most reliable priests, was both under the ground and somewhere else. In consequence his temple was being abandoned to the ravages of time, who for thousands of shame-faced years had been reluctant to go near the place. Now the suddenly released, accumulated weight of all those pent-up seconds was bearing down heavily on the unbraced stones. Hrun glanced up at the widening cracks and sighed. Then he put two fingers into his mouth and whistled. Strangely the real sound rang out loudly over the pseudo-sound of the widening astral whirlpool that was forming in the middle of the great octagonal slab. It was followed by a hollow echo which sounded, he fancied strangely like the bouncing of strange bones. Then came a noise with no hint of strangeness. It was hollow hoofbeats. Hrun's warhorse cantered through a creaking archway and reared up by its pounded sure-footed along the tunnels leaping sudden slides of rubble and adroitly side-stepping huge stones as they thundered down from the straining roof. Rin swined, clinging on grimly looked behind them. No wonder the horse was moving so swiftly close behind, speeding through the flickering violet light, were a large ominous-looking chest and a picture box that skittered along dangerously on its three legs. So great was the ability of sapient pearwood to follow its master anywhere, the grave goods of dead emperors had traditionally been made of it. They reached the outer air a moment before the octagonal arch finally broke and smashed into the flags. The sun was rising. Behind them a column of dust rose as the temple collapsed in on itself, but they did not look back. That was a shame, because Tu Flower might have been able to obtain pictures unusual even by disc world standards. There was movement in the smoking ruins. They seemed to be growing a but time, having initially gone for the throat, 
was now setting out to complete the job. The boiling interface between decaying magic and ascendant entropy roared down the hill and overtook the galloping horse, whose riders, being themselves creatures of time, completely failed to notice it. But it lashed into the enchanted forest with the whip of centuries. Impressive, isn't it? Observed a voice by Rinswine's knee as the horse cantered through the haze of decaying timber and falling leaves. The voice had an eerie metallic ring to it. Rinswine looked down at Kring the sword. It had a couple of rubies set in the pommel. He got the impression they were watching him. From the moorland rimwards of the wood they watched the battle between the trees and time, which could only have one ending. It was a sort of cabaret to the main business of the halt, which was the consumption of quite a lot of a bear which had incautiously come within bowshot of Hrun. Tu Flower was helping the hero sort through the treasure stolen from the temple. It was mostly silver set with unpleasant purple stones. Representations of spiders, octopi, and the tree-dwelling octarseer of the hubland wastes figured largely in the heap. Rinswine tried to shut his ears to the grating voice beside him. It was no use. And then I belonged to the Pasha of Ridurat and played a prominent part in the Battle of the Great Nef, which is where I received the slight nick you may have noticed some two-thirds of the way up my blade, Kring was saying from its temporary home in a tussock. Some infidel was wearing an octiron collar, most unsporting, and of course I was a lot sharper in those days and my master used to use me to cut silk handkerchiefs in mid-air and... Am I boring you? Hey? Oh, no, no, not at all. It's all very interesting, said Rinswind, with his eyes still on Hrun. How trustworthy would he be? Here they were. Out in the wilds, there were trolls about. I could see you were a cultured person, Kring went on. Seldom do I get to meet really what I'd really like is to be a plowshare. I don't know what that is, but it sounds like an existence with some point to it. To flower hurried over to the wizard I had a great idea, he burbled. Yeah, said Rinswind, wearily. Why don't we get Hrun to accompany us to Quirm? To Flower looked amazed. How did you know? He said. I just thought you'd think it, said Rinswind. Hrun ceased stuffing silverware into his saddlebags and grinned encouragingly at them. Then his eyes strayed back to the luggage. If we had him with us, who'd attack us? Said To Flower. Rinswind scratched his chin. Run. He suggested. But we saved his life in the temple. Well, if by attack you mean kill, said Rinswind, I don't think he'd do that. He's not that sort. He'd just rob us and tie us up and leave us for the wolves, I expect. Then the answer hit him. He looked from Run to the picture box. The picture imp was doing its laundry in a tiny tub while the salamanders dozed in their cage. I.V.E. got an idea, he said. I mean, what is it heroes really want? Gold. Said to Flower. No. I mean really want. To Flower frowned. I don't quite understand, he said. Rinswind picked up the picture box. Run, he said. Come over here, will you? The days passed peacefully. True, a small band of bridge trolls tried to ambush them on one occasion, and a party of brigands nearly caught them unawares one night, but unwisely tried to investigate the luggage before slaughtering the sleepers. Hrun demanded, and got, double pay for both occasions. If any harm comes to us, said Rinswind then there will be no one to he carefully wrapped the picture in troll skin and stowed it in his saddlebag, along with the others. It seems to be working, said to Flower admiringly, as Hrun rode ahead to scout the road. Sure, said Rinswind. What heroes like best is themselves. You're getting quite good at using the picture box, you know that. Yar. 
so you might like to have this. Tu Flower held out a picture. What is it? asked Rin Swind. Oh, just the picture you took in Dot the Temple. Rin Swind looked in horror. There, bordered by a few glimpses of tentacle, was a huge, whirled, calloused, potion-stained and unfocused thumb. That's the story of my life, he said wearily. You win, said fate, pushing the heap of souls across the gaming table. The assembled gods relaxed. There will be other games, he added. Is the only friend of the poor and the best doctor for the mortally wounded. Death, although of course completely eyeless, watched Rinswine disappearing with what would, had his face possessed any mobility at all, have been a frown. Death, although exceptionally busy at all times, decided that he now had a hobby there was something about the wizard that irked him beyond measure. He didn't keep appointments for one thing. I'll get you yet, Cully, said Death, in the voice like the slamming of leaden coffin lids. 3. The lure of the WIRM it was called the Wormberg and it rose almost one half of a mile above the Green Valley, a mountain huge, grey and upside down. At its base it was a mere score of yards across. Then it rose through clinging cloud, curving gracefully outward like an upturned trumpet until it was truncated by a plateau fully a quarter of a mile across. There was Ant's dovecot. This would mean that the doves had a wingspan slightly in excess of 40 yards. I knew it, said Rinswind. We're in a strong magical field. To Flower and Run looked around the little hollow where they had made their noonday halt. Then they looked at each other. The horses were quietly cropping the rich grass by the stream. Yellow butterflies skittered among the bushes. There was a smell of thyme and a buzzing of bees. The wild pigs on the spit sizzled gently. Hrun shrugged and went back to oiling his biceps. They gleamed. Looks all right to me, he said. Try tossing a coin, said Rinswind. What? Go on. Toss a coin. Hokai, said Hrun. If it gives you any pleasure. He reached into his pouch and withdrew a handful of loose change plundered from a dozen realms. Edge, said Rinswind, without looking at it. Magic never dies. It merely fades away. Nowhere was this more evident on the wide blue expanse of the disc world than in those areas that had been the scene of the great battles of the Mage Wars, which had happened very shortly after creation. In those days magic in its raw state had been widely available, and had been eagerly utilized by the first men in their war against the gods. The precise origins of the mage wars have been lost in the fogs of time, but disc philosophers agree that the first men, shortly after their creation, understandably lost their temper. And great and pyrotechnic were the battles that followed. The sun wheeled across the sky, the seas boiled, Weird storms ravaged the land, small white pigeons mysteriously appeared in people's clothing, and the very stability of the disc, carried as it was through space on the backs of four giant turtle-riding elephants, was threatened. This resulted in stern action by the old high ones, to whom even the gods themselves are answerable. The gods were rinswined, to flower and run stared at the coin. Edge it is, said Hrun. Well, you're a wizard. So what? I don't do. That sort of spell. You mean you can't? Rinswind ignored this, because it was true. Try it again, he suggested. Hrun pulled out a fistful of coins. The first two landed in the usual manner. So did the fourth. The third landed on its edge and balanced there. The fifth turned into a small yellow caterpillar and crawled away. The sixth, upon reaching its zenith, vanished with a sharp spang. A moment later there was a small thunder clap. Hey, that one was silver, exclaimed Hrun, rising to his feet and staring upwards. Bring it back. I don't know where it's gone, 
said Rinswind wearily. It's probably still accelerating. The ones I tried this morning didn't come down, anyway. Generated here, and we're feeling the after effects. Precisely, said a passing bush runs head jerked down. You mean this is one of those places? He asked. Let's get out of here. Right, agreed Rinswind. If we retrace our steps we might make it. We can stop every mile or so and toss a coin. He stood up urgently and started stuffing things into his saddlebags. What? said to Flower. Rinswine stopped. Look, he snapped. Just don't argue. Come on. It looks all right, said to Flower. Just a bit underpopulated that's all. Yes, said Rinswind. Odd, isn't it? Come on. There was a noise high above them, like a strip of leather being slapped on a wet rock. Something glassy and indistinct passed over Rinswind's head, throwing up the young woman glanced at the scrying glass. Heading rimwards at speed, she reported. By the way. They ve still got that box on legs. The old man chuckled, an oddly disturbing sound in the dark and dusty crypt. Sapient pearwood, he said. Remarkable. Yes, I think we will have that. Please see to it, my dear. Before they go beyond your power, perhaps. Silence. Or or what, Lyasa? said the old man, in this dim light there was something odd about the way he was slumped in the stone chair. You killed me once already, remember? She snorted and stood up, tossing back her hair scornfully. It was red, flecked with gold. Erect, Lyasa Wormbitter was entirely a magnificent sight. She was also almost naked, except for a couple of mere scraps of the lightest chainmail and riding boots of iridescent dragon hide. In one boot was thrust a riding crop, unusual in that it was as long as a spear and tipped with tiny steel barbs. Course, that since he had been dead for three months his eyes were in any case not in the best of condition. The other was that as a wizard. Even a dead wizard of the fifteenth grade, his optic nerves had long since become attuned to seeing into levels and dimensions far removed from common reality, and were therefore somewhat inefficient at observing the merely mundane. During his life they had appeared to others to be eight-faceted and eerily insectal. Besides, since he was now suspended in the narrow space between the living world and the dark shadow world of death he could survey the whole of causality itself. That was why apart from a mild hope that this time his wretched daughter would get herself killed, he did not devote his considerable powers to learning more about the three travelers galloping desperately out of his realm. Several hundred yards away, Lyasa was in a strange humor as she strode down the worn steps that led into the hollow heart of the Wormberg followed by half a dozen riders. Would this be the opportunity? Perhaps here was the key to break the deadlock the key to the throne of the was told. The biggest of the three now fleeing the dragon lands might do. And if it turned out that he wouldn't, then dragons were always hungry and needed to be fed regularly. She could see to it that they got ugly. Uglier than usual, anyway. The stairway passed through a stone arch and ended in a narrow ledge near the roof of the great cavern where the WIRMS roosted. Sunbeams from the myriad entrances around the walls cries crossed the dusty gloom like amber rods in which a million golden insects had been preserved. Below, they revealed nothing but a thin haze. Above. The walking rings started so close to Lyasa's head that she could reach up and touch one. They stretched away in their thousands across the upturned acres of the cavern roof. It had taken a score of masons a score of years to hammer the pitons for all those, hanging from their work as they progressed. Yet they were as nothing compared to the 88 major rings that clustered near the apex of the dome. A further 50 had the dragons sense Lyasa's presence. Air swishes around the cavern as 88 pairs of wings unfold like a complicated puzzle. 
great heads with green, multifaceted eyes peered down at her. The beasts were still faintly transparent. While the men around her take their hook boots from the rack, Lyasa bends her mind to the task of full visualization, about her in the musty air the dragons become fully visible, bronze scales dully reflecting the sunbeam shafts. Her mind throbs, but now that the power is flowing fully she can, with barely a unur of concentration, think of other things. Now she too buckles on the hook boots and turns a graceful cartwheel to bring their hooks, with a faint clung, against a couple of the walking rings in the ceiling. Only now it is the floor. The world has changed. Now she is standing on the edge of a deep bowl or crater, floored with the little rings across which the dragon riders are already strolling with a pendulum grit. In the joyable, he says in her mind. I thought I said there were to be no unaccompanied flights. She snaps. I was hungry, Lyasa. Curb your hunger. Soon there will be horses to eat. The reins stick in our teeth. Are there any warriors? We like warriors. Lyasa swings down the mounting ladder and lands with her legs locked around Lalitha's leathery neck. The warrior is mine. There are a couple of others you can have. One appears to be a wizard of sorts, she adds by way of encouragement. Oh, you know how it is with wizards. Half an hour afterwards you could do with another one, the dragon grumbles. He spreads his wings and drops. They're gaining, screamed Rinswind. He bent even lower over his horse's neck and groaned. To flower was trying to keep up while at the door those trees no dragons could fly. He heard the clap of wings before shadows folded around him. Instinctively he rolled in the saddle and felt the white hot stab of pain as something sharp scored a line across his shoulders. Behind him Hrun screamed, but it sounded more like a bellow of rage than a cry of pain. The barbarian had vaulted down into the heather and had drawn the black sword, Kring. He flourished it as one of the dragons curved in for another low pass. No bloody lizard does that to me. He roared. Rinswind leaned over and grabbed to Flower's reins. Come on, he hissed. But, the dragons said to Flower, entranced. Blast the began the wizard, and froze. Another dragon had peeled off from the circling dots overhead and was gliding towards them. Rinswind let go of Tuflower's horse, swore bitterly, and spurred his own mount towards the trees, alone. He didn't look back at the sudden commotion heard before the flashing blue lights of unconsciousness closed in was a high reptilian scream of frustration, and the thrashing of talons in the treetops. When he awoke a dragon was watching him, at least, it was staring in his general direction. Rinswind groaned and tried to dig his way into the moss with his shoulder blades, then gasped as the pain hit him. Through the mists of agony and fear he looked back at the dragon. The creature was hanging from a branch of a large dead oak tree, several hundred feet away. Its bronze gold wings were tightly wrapped around its body but the long equine head turned this way and that at the end of a remarkably prehensile neck. It was scanning the forest. It was also semi-transparent. Although the sun glinted off its scales, Rinswind could clearly make out the outlines of the branches behind it. On one of them a man was sitting, dwarfed by the hanging reptile. He appeared to be naked except for a pair of high boots, a tiny leather could do. Would it only half kill him? He decided not to stay and find out. Moving on heels, fingertips, and shoulder muscles, Rinswind wriggled sideways until foliage masked the oak and its occupants. Then he scrambled to his feet and haired off between the trees. He had no destination in mind, no provisions, and no horse. But while he still had legs he could run. Ferns and brambles whipped at him, but he didn't feel them at all. When he had put about a mile between him and the dragon he stopped and collapsed against a tree, which then spoke to him. PSST, it said. Dreading what he might see, 
Rin Swine let his gaze slide upwards. It tried to fasten on innocuous bits of bark and leaf, but the scourge of curiosity forced it to leave them behind. Finally it fixed on a black sword thrust straight through the branch above Rin Swine's head. Don't just stand there, said the sword, in a voice like the sound of a what happened to the others. Said Rin Swind, still clutching the tree desperately. Oh, the dragons got them. And the horses. And that box thing. Me too, except that Hrun dropped me. What a stroke of luck for you. Well began Rin Swind. Kring ignored him. I expect you'll be in a hurry to rescue them, it added. Yes, well so if you'll just pull me out we can be off. Rin Swine squinted up at the sword. A rescue attempt had hitherto been so far at the back of his mind that, if some advanced speculations on the nature and shape of the many-dimensioned multiplicity of the universe were correct, it was right at the front, but a magic sword was a valuable item and it would be a long trek back home, wherever that was. He scrambled up the tree and inched along the branch. Kring was buried very firmly in the wood. He gripped the pommel and heaved until lights flashed in front of his eyes. Um. I have had many names, you know. Amazing, said Rin Swind. He swayed backwards as the blade slid free. It felt strangely light. Back on the ground again he decided to break the news. I really don't think rescue is a good idea, he said. I think we'd better head back to a city, you know. To raise a search party. The dragons headed hubwards, said Kring. However, I suggest we start with the one in the trees over there. Sorry, but you can't leave them to their fate. Rinswind looked surprised. I can't. He said. No. You can't. Look, I'll be frank. I've worked with better material than you, but it's either that or have you ever spent a million years in a coal measure. Look I so if you don't stop arguing I'll chop your head off. K. Zdra the dragon rider leaned forward and scant across the clearing. I see him, he said. He swung himself down easily from branch to branch and landed lightly on the tussocky grass, drawing his sword. He took a long look at the approaching man, who was obviously not keen on leaving the shelter of the trees. He was armed, but the dragon rider observed with some interest the strange way in which the man held the sword in front of him at arm's length, as though embarrassed to be seen in its company. K. Zdra hefted his own sword and grinned expansively as the wizard shuffled towards him. Then he leapt. Later, he remembered only two things about the fight. He recalled the uncanny way in which the wizard's sword curved up and caught his own blade with a shock that jerked it out of his grip. The other thing and it was this, he averred, that led to his downfall. Was that the wizard was covering his eyes with one hand. K. Zdra jumped back to avoid another thrust and fell full length on the appeared to be singing to itself. Sifa. K. Zdra shouted. The dragon roared in defiance, but pulled out of the dive that would have removed Rinswine's head, and flapped ponderously back to the tree. Talk. Screamed Rinswind. K. Zdra squinted at him up the length of the sword. What would you like me to say? He asked. What? I said what would you like me to say? Where are my friends? The barbarian and the little man is what I mean. I expect they have been taken back to the Wormberg. Rinswine tugged desperately against the surge of the sword, trying to shut his mind to Kring's bloodthirsty humming. The Wormberg. There is only one. It is Dragon Home. And I suppose you were waiting to take me there, at something he was really going to have to go through with. Right then, he said as diffidently as he could manage. You'd better take me to this Wormberg of yours, hadn't you? I was supposed to take you in dead, muttered Kay, Zdra sullenly. 
Rinswind looked down at him and grinned slowly. It was a wide, manic, and utterly humorless rictus that was the sort of grin that is normally accompanied by small riverside birds wandering in and out picking scraps out of the teeth. Alive will do, said Rinswind. If we're talking about anyone being dead, remember whose sword is in which hand. If you kill me, nothing will prevent Sifa killing you, shouted the prone dragon rider. So what I'll do is, I'll chop bits off, agreed the wizard. He tried the effect of the grin again. Oh, all right, said K, Zdra sulkily. Do you think I've got an imagination? I mean, there is no other way. It's flying or nothing. Rinswind looked again at the dragon before him. He could quite clearly see through it to the crushed grass on which it lay but, when he gingerly touched a scale that was a mere golden sheen on thin air, it felt solid enough. Either dragons should exist completely or fail to exist at all, he felt. A dragon only half existing was worse than the extremes. I didn't know dragons could be seen through, he said. K. Zdra shrugged. Didn't you? He said. He swung himself astride the dragon awkwardly because Rinswind was hanging on to his belt. Once uncomfortably aboard the wizard moved his white knuckle grip to a convenient piece of harness and prodded K. Zdra lightly with the sword. Have you ever flown before? Said the dragon rider without looking round. Not as such, no. Would you like something to suck? Into the air. Rinswind occasionally had nightmares about teetering on some intangible but enormously high place, and seeing a blue-distanced, cloud-punctuated landscape reeling away below him, this usually woke him up with his ankles sweating, he would have been even more worried had he known that the nightmare was not, as he thought just the usual disc world vertigo. It was a backwards memory of an event in his future so terrifying that it had generated harmonics of fear all the way along his lifeline. This was not that event, but it was good practice for it. Sifa clawed its way into the air with a series of vertebrae shattering bounds. At the top of its last leap the wide wings unfolded with a snap and spread out with a thump which shook the trees. Then the ground was gone dropping away in a series of gentle jerks. Sifa was suddenly rising gracefully, the afternoon sunlight gleaming off wings that were still no more than a golden film. Rinswind made the mistake of glancing downwards, and found himself looking through the dragon to the treetops below. Far below. His behold the Wormberg. Rinswind turned his head slowly, taking care to keep Kring resting lightly on the dragon's back. His streaming eyes saw the impossibly inverted mountain rearing out of the deep forested valley like a trumpet in a tub of nose. Even at this distance he could make out the faint octarine glow in the air that must be indicating a stable magic aura of at least. He gasped. Several milliprime? At least. Oh no, he said even looking at the ground was better than that. He averted his eyes quickly and realized that he could now no longer see the ground through the dragon. As they glided around in a wide circle towards the Wormberg it was definitely taking on a more solid form, as if the creature's body was filling with a gold mist. By the time the Wormberg was in front of them, swinging wildly across the sky, the dragon was as real as a rock. Rinswine thought he could see a faint streak in the air as if something he made the mistake of following the thread of foaming water with his eyes, and jerked himself back just in time. The flared plateau of the upturned mountain drifted towards them. The dragon didn't even slow. As the mountain loomed over Rinswind like the biggest fly swatter in the universe he saw a cave mouth. Sifa schemed towards it, shoulder muscles pumping. The wizard screamed as the dark spread and enfolded him. There was a brief vision of rock flashing past, blurred by speed. Then the dragon was in the open again. It was inside a cave, but bigger than any cave had a right to be. The dragon, gliding across its vast emptiness, was a mere gilded fly in a banqueting hall. 
there were other dragons. Gold, silver, black, white. Flapping across the sun-shafted air on errands of their own or perched on outcrops of rock. High in the domed roof of the cavern scores of others hung from of what to do next. Well. He asked, in a whisper. Any suggestions? Obviously you attack, said Kring scornfully. Why didn't I think of that? Said Rinswind could it be because they all have crossbows? You're a defeatist. Defeatist? That's because I'm going to be defeated. You're your own worst enemy, Rinswind, said the sword. Rinswind looked up at grinning men. Bet. He said wearily. Before Kring could reply Sifa reared in midair and alighted on one of the large rings, which rocked alarmingly. Would you like to die now, or surrender first? Asked Kay, Zdra calmly. Men were converging on the ring from all directions, walking with a swaying motion as their hooked boots engaged the ceiling rings. Their down faces. The dragon folk's taste in clothing didn't run to anything much more imaginative than a leather harness, studded with bronze ornaments. Knives and sword sheaths were worn inverted. Those who were not wearing helmets let their hair flow freely, so that it moved like seaweed in the ventilation breeze near the roof. There were several women among them. The inversion did strange things to their anatomy. Rinswine stared. Surrender said Kay, Zdra again. Rinswind opened his mouth to do so. Kring hummed a warning, and agonizing waves of pain shot up his arm. Never, he squeaked. The pain stopped. Of course he won't. Boomed an expansive voice behind him. He's a hero, isn't he? Rinswind turned and looked into a pair of hairy nostrils. They belonged to a heavily built young man, hanging nonchalantly from the ceiling by his boots. Think of as a kind of integral punctuation. You have come to challenge me in mortal combat. Well, no, I didn't you are mistaken. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.